Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Asia Tech Podcast. Asia Tech Podcast. Tech 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 Podcast. Tech 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 Podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Number 11, broadcasting to you direct from Tokyo, Bangkok. Today, we are talking about food delivery services, the latest startups, the latest investments in Asia. Enjoy the show. Asia Tech Podcast. Let's talk about food. Let's talk about food delivery. I love this subject. Yeah, so do I. I mean, do you want to just tell me, maybe you want to just lead in a little bit by telling me what you see. I mean, I, in Japan, right, there, there's a massive food delivery business already with just Obento and everything else, no? Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, eating out here is big. But not so much in the past has been the food delivery service. But, you know, a lot of foreign companies came to Japan, people like Domino's, and made a lot of inroads. And obviously, uh, McDonald's, um, big in Asia with food delivery. But we also have Uber Eats, which is a new player in Japan. And that's really interesting because you wonder whether Uber is going into these markets to make money out of food delivery or just to get a foothold for its you know, it's taxi service. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on. I mean, Japan's a big market. Asia is a huge market. I mean, they say, look at the latest data here, that Asia, Asia Pacific is worth $45 billion, which is the same as the rest of the world combined for food delivery. And we're really yeah, er, early days with food delivery. I mean, if you consider all the latest developments, you know, how big yeah, this just, could really be. Yeah, it just seems to me, right, like, so if that's $45 billion, that's just in, what, GMV, right? Yeah. In other words, just the gross market value of it. But I just wonder what the profitability is going to be in a business like that. And I, and again, I wonder about Japan because Japan's going to be a much more mature market. I know here from people in that business, you know, the, the companies like Food Panda and whether it before was Food by Phone and some of these other companies are charging like 25 to 30% delivery fees. Hmm on top of whatever the cost of buying things is. And, and whether it's restaurant buying or even just grocery buying, which I think are kind of two different categories, but close enough, I think, at least at this stage of their development to be comparable because, you know, at least in Southeast Asia, and again, I don't know how it happens in Japan, but I'm presuming there are more like regular vehicles, like cars and vans, as opposed to in Thailand and Malaysia and stuff, where there's probably going to be more motorcycles, right? It's mostly motorcycles here as well. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. But, but what does that mean? I mean, I used to, when I was in Tokyo, I used to ride a Vespa and I also had a CBR 400 or some such thing. But I don't remember there being a lot of motorbikes doing delivery. Is that a new thing? Yeah, well, it must be. You know, I came to Japan two years ago, last this time. And I see them everywhere now. Domino's, you know, Pizza La. Oh, right, they're, right. They're there. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot. You're talking about the covered scooters. Yeah, so those things. Rain, yeah. Even in the rain, the guys yeah. and the gals still deliver. Yikes. You see them everywhere. But I wonder, but, you know, you, we've now got Uber Eats here. And I think Uber Eats is making inroads all over Asia now. And I just wonder about, I mean, you say the profitability of the delivery model and we've talked about this in previous episodes as well right i mean it's a tough model to crack but then you take somebody like uber eats who comes into the market who can effectively i don't know i mean i don't know their game whether it's a loss leader for the bigger picture but they can come in and they can really squeeze the margins and make no money effectively just yeah, so they I mean, can get seems, foothold it seems to me and like I, I see this right so uber launches in japan it launches kind of in the last quarter of last year it's launched here as well i presume it's launched in the rest of southeast asia and to me this seems like a real loss leader for them but but to be fair from an uber perspective and i consider uber to be a software and also a logistics company it seems like everything they're do everything they're doing is just trying to dominate the local market wherever that is and then just trying to crush whatever competition it is in the delivery of humans and the delivery of things that aren't going to go sour. Um, because I don't think right now Uber is going to do grocery delivery, which we can talk about a little bit about later. 
Um, but I think they're really just trying to lose, 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 subsidize everything until either the taxi companies or the other delivery companies cry uncle and give up. Mm. But I, but you know, and again, really super brand and I was analyzing their software, which I'm constantly doing. And it's so good, at least in my mind. Um, and you don't have like in the United States where people can say, you know, every time they argue about whether Uber is a good company or a bad company, now, we can leave that aside as well. But there's competition in the United States on the full Uber front. So you have companies like Lyft and then other local companies that are competing with them. But in Southeast Asia, except for Grab, really, nobody else is really competing. There is no Lyft. At least there's no Lyft in Bangkok. Um, and I don't believe they're anywhere in Thailand. But it seems to me that this company is going to try to go out and just dominate anything that logistically needs to get delivered. Hmm. Right. And I, don't, I think it's going to be hard to stop them, frankly, regardless of all the arguments about their internal corporate culture, which is horrible. They don't have a good PR record. I mean, this guy, Travis Kalanick, he's not a, a good front man, is he really, in terms of PR? He seems to have the, uh, I mean, he doesn't get, he doesn't have that soft, cuddly feel that you get from somebody like a <laughs> Howard Schultz or a Jeff Bezos, right? <laughs> no, who may, may, you know, who are actually probably as guilty as Uber are in terms of dominating the market, but they just don't seem to have that positive PR spin. And that doesn't help them going into these new markets, does it? No, it sure doesn't. I mean, I wonder what would have happened to Andrew Carnegie or, or, right. or John uh, Rockefeller if they tried to go into the developing market outside the United States. And I wonder what types of conversations they had in private mm. about how they were going to dominate their markets. And to be fair, there's there are records of them on the record. So on what I'll call on tape in front of Congress, just saying, look, we're doing this. We're going to dominate. We don't really care what you people think. And that was the whole <laughs> era, era of monopolists. Exactly. So none of it's good. Let's just be clear. About it. None of it's good, but I frankly don't think it's any different than it has been. I know that's going to be a slightly controversial comment, but I don't like it any more than anybody else. But I think when you're building a business and everybody is against you, sometimes you have to do things that other people don't like. Now, that doesn't mean they're right and they're good. Right. I'm not saying, but 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 fair enough. Um, but here's what I think happens, right? I mean, I think Uber is going to be a, a continual piece of whatever types of logistics is taking place. And you see, at least in Thailand, there's been some government pushback because they want their own motorcycles and they want their local taxi drivers to be able to take the place or replace Uber um, in, in its concept of moving people around and also moving things around. But I think there's a really strong opinion on that as well. And, and I have very strong feelings about this. In Japan, and we've talked about this before, you hail a taxi, they legally have to take you to where you say you want to go. Hmm. Just legally. And, and I would say 99 times out of 100, you get into a taxi, it's very rare for the taxi driver who's stopped to pick you up to say, I'm sorry, I can't go there. Right. But in Bangkok, you can get into a taxi and the taxi driver will say, eh, I don't feel like it. And I've actually been <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I've, so, so, but that's also appropriate for if you give them something to deliver to somebody else, they can also say they don't want to do it. And I have been in taxis where the taxi driver literally, once you sit in the car, gets a phone call from a friend, a girlfriend, a partner, whatever it is, and says, I'm sorry, I've got to go pick up my friend. You need to get out of that taxi. Right. Exactly. That's not a good base to build a logistics network on, right? No, it's not. But, but again, but, sorry, but I digress a little bit. I'm, Getting back to this whole concept of food delivery, right? There are multiple ways to look at this. And I think at the low end of the market, companies like Uber and, and companies like Grab, to be fair, are going to take this market. There is a big demand for it. The real question is who's going to make the money and are the subsidies that exist right now still going to be viable as we move to, I'd say, three to five years into the future? And if not, what is the pricing going to end up looking like? A normal restaurant, like I said, to acquire customers and to keep those customers from going away, pays some of these delivery services something like 25 to 30 percent of each order. That's a lot of money for a restaurant, hmm. right? So the question is, what are they spending on normal advertising to draw those clients into their restaurants, just in, in regular foot traffic or just sitting down in the restaurant, as opposed to delivering that stuff? And I, I think that's a real question. And I think it must be cheaper for them now not to pay that 30% for delivery. They're going to have to figure out a new model. So we see other companies doing this. I mean, if you look at some of the 
if you look at some of the analyses of some of the, the companies that do do this, there are companies that advertise themselves. We don't offer anything on top. Right. Right. We don't. There's no margin on top of it. So the, the customer themselves don't have to pay for it. But I still think in the end, the restaurants are going to have to end up paying for it. Right. I mean, some of these companies like Chef's XP in Bangkok says that they don't charge the client for it. But you definitely know they're charging the restaurant. And I'm sure yeah, that this have to. Up in Japan, right? Yeah. And then you have, I mean, on top of that, you've got players like McDonald's in China, which claim to have a billion dollar food delivery service. So whether they're sort of owning the whole chain, if you like. And right. you know, so, they, they have the logistics to make that work. I mean, if everybody's going to make that work, it's going to be McDonald's. So that's sort of an interesting, I don't know if that's an elephant in the room yet, because they're a different market altogether than maybe people who are ordering in food. But they're always there, and they're always going to eat away at the low end of that market. Right, but remember, that's their own internal cost. And this is why I would make the case that a company like Domino's or Pizza Hut or in you know, Bangkok, Pizza La, and companies similar to that that run their own logistics and delivery business, I think those businesses are going to be additive. And in the end, I think they're going to, they're going to continue to be the main way that large chain restaurants deliver their food mm. to people that order it that don't want to eat in. Now I see this every day. I go and sit with some guys every day for about two to three hours. They, they order lunch every day and they're generally getting it either from Food Panda or from Uber Eats. Okay. But they do it and they always do it with a special code. So they're not paying anything for the delivery. They're actually getting a discount on it. Right. But I do think in the end, like you said, companies like Domino's and the pizza companies and also McDonald's the same way they do this in China They're going to dominate that space for their own restaurants because to them. They're just shifting costs around right right right. Yeah Well, how is it in Bangkok because here in Japan? You know if I was to order three pizzas three medium pizzas right Japanese medium. We're not talking American medium, right? Japanese medium pizzas. I'm spending like 60 bucks I mean, you know, that's compared to the US. I think that's pretty expensive, right? So I don't think it's good value here in Japan for food delivery. How is it in Bangkok? It's, a, I mean, it's expensive in, in relative terms, right? You buy a pizza, it costs you 350 baht. It's like a, th a little bit more than a thousand yen. So if you're buying three of them, it's about $45 mm. to buy three pizzas. On top of that, if someone's paying, if someone's paying a 20% delivery fee, or even if they're paying 80 baht to get that delivered, you know, it's another two and a half dollars on top, but it's 45, $50 to do that. You know, you can go out and get that. And and believe me, because the mapping, here's one of the biggest problems as well. Because the mapping systems and the POI systems here are not complete in the same way that they may be in the United States and they surely are in Japan because of the way the address system works in Japan and also the way the logistics companies have worked there forever, Yeah. right? Whether it's Kuro Neko Yamato or, 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 you know, Sagawa Cuban, they know where you are. Yeah, unbelievable. It, they know, right? I mean, they've mapped this out for the past 40 or so years. I don't know how they've done it, particularly with that address system, but it's amazing. Yeah. But, but here, it's not, it's, not, it's not done yet. And I work with a few companies that rely on the POIs. And even, even if I order pizza to my house or my daughter orders pizza to my house, 30-minute promise delivery sometimes takes an hour, sometimes takes an hour and a half. And to be fair, sometimes I have to get on my own Vespa and go run and get the delivery yeah. guy down the street. So what do they use? Do they use POIs or do they use GPS? And how does it work there? So it's multiple ways. There's like your individual house, your GPS is calculated using your own phone, right? And whatever other system you have to do that. But, but it, on the map, on the Google Maps or whoever's doing the mapping system here, it's just everything hasn't been mapped yet. So all the sort of Google Maps where they drive around the city and the same thing that they do in, in Japan and, and on Apple, it just hasn't been finished yet. Right. Yeah. So you literally have to move the pin to the exact place. And even with that, sometimes the delivery still takes time because while we talked about big companies like Federal Express and DKSH and some of the big logistics companies in Thailand are really good at taking big pallets off of big boats from a port and bringing them to the distribution center for the central group or the mall group. They've got that nailed and they do it really well and they're super efficient and they're very price sensitive. But the business to consumer stuff still is not perfected yet. And we know many companies that are trying to do this, even on the product side, right? I mean, you know, like, 
line has also entered this business in, in Bangkok, mm. right? And in mm. Thailand. And they use something called Line Man. They'll, do, they'll deliver anything. And it's more like you have a one-to-one relationship with that motorcycle guy or gal to deliver that stuff for you. Mm-hmm. So it's a, that's a slightly different business model as well. And again, Line, in a way that's similar to Uber, has not figured out 100% how they're going to make money off of all the services that they offer. Mm-hmm. Right. So one of their big revenue sources is the stickers that they sell. They're trying mm-hmm. to figure out to deliver stuff here. You know, they say 80 baht, but again they'll give you discount codes for everything at the beginning, which is interesting for them too, because they already have something like 30, 35 million people use line in Thailand. Hmm. So it's one of the biggest messaging systems here. But again, they still haven't figured out how to get this done properly. And even a company like food Panda, which has been around and is really an amalgamation of a few companies here. I think the old food by phone business was sold to them that they were pioneers in this space. I just don't think anybody's completely figured it out. Um, and the people that are trying, so there's a different business model too. We haven't spoken at all about Ginja. I know Ginja really well because I know the CEO. So let's get that, let's get that off to the side to begin with. Hmm. But they're trying to do something different. They're trying to create an entire system, not just a POS, not just an ordering system, and not just a delivery and logistics system. They're trying to do front-to-back restaurant service. It's a completely different model, right? Whereas the line team just says, Call the restaurant, call the motorcycle, we'll put them together, we'll deliver to you. Food Panda, same thing. They don't necessarily want to be involved in the re- restaurant's business per se. They just want to handle the delivery stuff. And the other, the other people that are doing this, even Chef's XP, they don't want to be involved in that business either. But Ginja says, we want to build the entire stack. Mm. We want to be a real tech company. We want to be a real SaaS tech company. It's a completely different take on this food delivery model. And as always, I like to say, they're using delivery as a Trojan horse to get into some of these larger chains like Bonchon, which is a big Korean style fried chicken business. And they're trying to work with some of these companies to to dominate that entire stack for these companies. So it's different. But again, they're they're right at the beginning of their of their business journey and they're still trying to figure out stuff as well. So you've got all these different models out there. You've got Ginja, which is trying to be the full stack, going into the restaurants and, you know, trying to, I suppose, create the, an end-to-end experience for the customer. And then on the other side, you've got the guys like Chef's XP, Food Panda. Then you have like Line, Uber Eats, which are really just saying, you know, we're just going to join the dots here, right? Basically, where do you see the the winners coming from? What area do you see you know producing the most profit long term? I'm I'm much more I'm much more believer in a company's ability to run the full stack, and I think it's just stickier that way, right? So if you're a restaurant, right. let's just say you're Bunchon, which is listed on the Ginjo website, so I'm not giving away any information. If they can come in and run some of your internals, so making your ordering from externally easier and faster and more sophisticated. You can actually end up doing some very interesting things, right? So you can actually run a business very similar to what Domino's does. Right? Domino's, you can't go sit in a Domino's pizza place. Yeah. They just don't have any – they have outlets, but you can't go sit there and eat there. You can probably walk into them. I know you can in Thailand and order for delivery. Mm-hmm. But imagine a restaurant – pick any restaurant that you like in, in, in Tokyo and imagine that they just build a um, – a bespoke kitchen just to produce food for delivery. So you cannot sit in there either. They can increase their capacity massively. They install an ordering system that's just for delivery out of that kitchen. And then they give it to a company like Ginja who is bespoke for them as well. And that entire stack is taken care of. And then what you do is instead of being a restaurant business, now you're really a logistics business as well. And I think from that perspective, the model that Ginja is trying to implement could be the most powerful, right? Because the, the team at Line, as great as they are with the chat and the stickers and that style of business and even Food Panda with, with building technology that allows you to order and even tracking where your driver is, they're not involved in helping the restaurants themselves actually build and expand their business. Mm. And just like everything else in Thailand and the rest of Southeast Asia, there is an opportunity to create these big new brands where people – don't have to order Kentucky Fried Chicken or they don't have to order McDonald's or Burger King. They can create a new brand. And if you can can do that using a platform like 
Ginjo, which is, again, very different from Uber Eats, from Food Panda, from Line Man, then you can build a really easily scalable and quickly building business because they own the whole stack. Hmm. And they take a small piece of it, right? They're just trying to get a slice, I believe. And then you can build all of these kind of bespoke kitchens that just do for delivery. And I think that actually ends up being really significant. So in my mind, that type of business model I believe, works really, really well. And I don't think scaling is that difficult. Again, on the software side, you're talking about a SaaS business. But once it gets in to a restaurant, and then once you can prove the fact that it works, you build a bespoke kitchen, they start making food only for delivery, and then your system runs that whole thing, the stickiness again, how do you change that system once you have it embedded in the in the, in the the yeah. DNA of the business? I think it's really hard. Right. And it's a cookie cutter model, isn't it? Once you've done one, it's pretty much the same for every kitchen that you go to. So it's going to be pretty straightforward. But if we're talking about logistics, Michael, what about players like Amazon? You know, I mean, we're thinking much further down the line. You know, we're going to five years out, right? I mean, they're effectively a logistics business now. I mean, they, they have now in Tokyo Amazon one-hour delivery. Right. You know, which is just phenomenal if you think about it, where we've got to now with the, you know, we've gone well beyond 28 days for delivery, right? We're now one-hour delivery. <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to, if we're talking one-hour delivery, you could apply that to food delivery, right? I mean, does that, is that a relevant market? Would that be something that should concern these guys? It should be. It should be a concern. I, I just, there's a part of me that really doesn't believe that Amazon wants to be in the cooked food delivery business. And I want to move into groceries in a second because I have an opinion on that as well. Amazon has been in Japan for how long now? I'm going to guess it's over 10 years because I remember I left Japan over five years ago. They were there when I was there, and they were there long before I left. So I believe that they're deeply embedded into all of the delivery stuff that's going on there. They, do, they, do, they don't do their own delivery, I don't believe. They probably outsource to people like the existing logistics Yamato, companies. Yeah, Yamato, right? yeah. So, so they don't have that embedded knowledge for last mile. I know they're working on that type of stuff with technology, including drones and robots and things like that in the United States, but I just don't think they're there yet. I never count Amazon out because Bezos has always invested for the long term and has always outperformed everybody's expectations about his ability to accomplish basically and everything that he said he was going to do. You remember he took the CD business and the yeah. video business and turned it into a streaming business. So that team knows how to do stuff and they know how to execute things. The difference is that running a logistics business in Southeast Asia as opposed to in Japan is much more difficult and much more non-trivial. And I think some of the people that have been doing it here longer either end up being um, buyout targets, right, M&A targets, or just, again, creating a new brand. Mm. You still cannot order directly from Amazon in Southeast Asia. So you, you can, but it doesn't get delivered locally, right? It gets delivered from somewhere in the United States, and then you end up paying duties and import fees and things like that. And it's just really not as um, as seamless as it would be in any other country where Amazon operates. So I still think that that's a few years away. Mm -hmm. And by the time that happens, I think there will be other delivery systems for people that are already here, other logistics systems for people that are already here. And I think, again, they either end up being too big for Amazon to buy or they end up being, you know, M&A targets for them to acquire, acquisition targets. Right. But so, either way, I don't think they end up dominating soon. Okay, gotcha. So let's shift focus a little bit to grocery delivery then because that's an area that Amazon has made inroads into, not, not with a lot of success, but then it's a lot harder than selling CDs and books, right? So what's your take on grocery delivery in Asia? Well, Where are we now? Well, we just had a few a few announcements, right? We had an announcement from Honest Bee, which is a company that's been around for a while and frankly hasn't ha taken a lot of funding over the past couple of years, but did raise one round of funding, about $15 million a couple of years ago. The CEO that runs that business is very experienced, comes out of a background in the United States and also running a very large logistics business here in, in Thailand. The, one of the issues that these companies face, so Honest Bee itself and then Delhi Shop and other companies like that, is that they're going up against, again, as we talked, the Pizza Huts mm. and the McDonald's of those spaces, which is Tesco and the Villa Markets, 
and the local markets and the tops that also do some of their own delivery. And the question is, will they add other services on top to take up the slack for that delivery or will they do it themselves is the first question. And the second question is, is it a proven model that people actually want to buy things that are perishable without actually looking at them and touching them in person? I just, I really don't believe that that's the case yet. And I know that a company like Honesty and other companies like it say that they actually train personal shoppers for you so that the person who's doing the shopping for you has your best interest in mind. Mm. But I really think when it comes right down to it, if I need tomatoes for tomato sauce, I want to go buy those myself. Right. Right. You, because, go ahead. Yeah. And you've also got that element in Asia as well where people send the maid to get this stuff, right? So the people that kind of would be buying it in other markets like the US or Europe, maybe in Asia, they got people to run around and get this stuff for them as well. That's another, that would take a slice out of the market as well. I don't know how big that market is in Asia, but it's significant enough, right? To, I think it's really, I think it's really large. I think this is one of those things where, you know, it's almost like web van way back in the early days in the United States where it was just a killer idea, but the tech hadn't caught up to it yet. Yeah. And I think just like that, Honest Bee is basically, you know, the web van or the shopping van of the United States of the, of the late 90s. And I think you bring up a great point, and that is most people that can afford that type of service will have a house help or someone that can go do their shopping for them that frankly has been doing it for them for 10 or 15 years and knows exactly what they want. Now they can make it a little bit easier for for the entire system if you buy non-perishable things like paper towels or food wrap mm. or Tupperware style things that you don't really care about their freshness. But I think from a freshness standpoint, you're gonna see a real, it's gonna take a really long game and it'll be a really long road to get those businesses to be successful. And I think the market might be a little bit early there. I will say this though, of all the companies that I've seen that exist in this space, I think the ones that have the biggest possibility of success, again, depending on their execution and their ability to fund themselves both from a bootstrap perspective and from an external perspective, are companies like Deli Shop. And I don't know a lot about this company, Deli Shop, but essentially what they're doing is they're saying, we'll shop at the high end for you. Hmm. Okay, so if you want great tasting wine, you know, we'll, we'll make recommendations for you and we'll buy great wine for you. We know the best seafood. We know the best meats to buy for you. We'll, we're not going to buy the, you know, the bottom 70% of olive oils. We'll just get the top 30%. And I think in that case, now you have the possibility. I always believe that these businesses start at the high end. And if they can fund it there, then I believe that that business can succeed over time because it's, again, it's bespoke. And the products that they have are special and highly differentiated. And I strongly believe in curated businesses as opposed to mass market businesses and to marketplaces. And this falls right into that category. I'm not saying I don't know the management so well for this business. I'm not saying whether they have the execution ability to do this. But from a market structure standpoint, I think a business like this has the real possibility to work because their target market right now is the target market that wants to and that can afford to shop online mm. for this product. Right. This is much more like a concierge service, isn't it? For your own Absolutely. This right. is like this is like being in a really fancy five star hotel room and saying, I need a gla- I need this kind of wine. I want this stuff for breakfast. You know, I I need this type of house care product. Right. And I want it to be curated and I want it to be differentiated. And I think from in that from that perspective, I think this works really, really well. Right. Because the margins are, are you know, give you a lot of enough space to better do the kind of requests, fulfill the kind of requests that people are asking for. And the kind of customers you're dealing with as well are less price sensitive, I guess. They're more, you know, interested in convenience and time saving. Absolutely. And also super high quality product. In a way, this reminds me, if you go back and look at the history of a supermarket in Japan called Mejia. Right, yeah. The idea was, I believe, and I be- was that just after the Meiji Restoration and as we sort of came into the 20th century in Japan, the, the people that were getting wealthy wanted great products from Europe, products that they could not necessarily get in Japan. 
And Meiji was a place that could charge a premium because they went out and imported all these fabulous products. And I think you're seeing that here, and I think that's going to work really well. People that want products from France or products from Italy or even products from the UK that they can't necessarily get in a regular supermarket here, or if they can, they can't get them easily. And the shopping experience may not be as great as they'd like. Here, from the comfort of their own home, they get to get those products that maybe they found when they were traveling. And then they can use those products to have a house party or do things that they would normally do at home, which they, to buy things that they can't normally get at a regular supermarket, whether it's Villa Supermarket or Tops or any of the other supermarkets that exist in Bangkok and the rest of, this, the rest of Southeast Asia. That's why, that's why I think this potentially works. Right. Right, that's an exciting market to be. What sort of ex what ex excites you about the whole Asian region with food delivery in general, Michael? What if you had to put your finger on it? If you had to back a couple of horses, where would you be putting your money if you had to commit? Well, so me, I, as a potential investor, or, or even just as a, as an interested observer, like I said, I like to see people that are dealing with full stack, right, and that are building a platform. And I think this is consistent with everything we talk about, and that is. Even for the deli shop, but go back to Ginja as well. You're, they're not just building a one, a one small service that helps one part of a business. They want to build the entire stack. So they want to modernize and replace a large swath of the market to the extent that every restaurant and every food production facility wants to do delivery and does delivery. Those platforms that get built, so a normal restaurant itself isn't going to be around for more than three or so years. A normal restaurant fails, actually, right? Something like, I don't know, 80% of new restaurants fail. It's a big number. And again, if you build a platform, just to go back to things we've spoken about in the past, like e-commerce, they don't care which e-commerce businesses are out there. They want to facilitate them all. And as one dies or changes tactics, they'll serve a new one. And I think a, a business in the food delivery space that builds a platform on top of which a restaurant can build an entire sustainable business. I think in that sense, those are the best businesses that I would build on and also the high end. And that's why I mentioned this, this deli shop because there are plenty of businesses out there that are trying to deliver just regular day-to-day -day products. And in the end, you get the difference between a company like Lazada that has a massive, we talked about this as a massive product discovery problem or you have a business like Where You Want that has doesn't have the same problem, has a very targeted audience and can charge a premium for products because it's highly curated. And I think from a commerce standpoint, those, those types of businesses are more likely to succeed. And from a platform business, I think a business like Ginja, again, is more likely to succeed because they're building the entire stack. So that's what excites me in, in that particular space. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wonder, right, again, I've been outside of Japan for a while, but that's why a business like Yamato and, um, and the Takubin companies actually end up being super successful. They don't care who puts product through their platform. That platform is the thing that makes them most money, right? Mm -hmm. And for anybody that hasn't experienced the, the Takubin or the Yamato service here in Japan, I mean... Wow, it's phenomenal. I mean, we, we sort of hear a lot about the train service here in Japan, but the, the logistics service is equal, if not better, than the train service. Their, their ability to deliver without a proper address system. And if they, you know, it, the, the amazing thing about here in the delivery service, and you've experienced this, I'm sure, is that if you're not there in the morning, they'll come back in the afternoon and deliver again. You know, that guy will be up and down that street in his old rickety old van. I don't know what technology is going on inside, but the van's like 30 or 40 years old. And the guy's, you know, like he's in his 60s or 70s. But just there's something about the system and the culture of that whole delivery service that makes it super efficient. Right. So one of the things that the Takubin companies have done, I think that that's being mirrored actually by what's going on in some of your logistics companies in, in Southeast Asia, is that that Kuroneke Omato guy literally do, distributes only on like two or three streets right he's got a really small area into which he has to deliver into which he has to know right so what he does is he'll sit in one of the parking lots up at the top of that street twice a day he'll either get product delivered to him from one of the hubs and spokes of that delivery system or he'll go to a warehouse and pick up things it's probably twice a day like you said once in the morning 
and once in the afternoon. And I, I believe that that same system is now being implemented here with a lot of the smart routing. But one of the things that the motorcycle taxi systems do here already is they have areas of expertise and they have regions and they only operate inside those regions unless a customer, so a human wants to go and cross one of those regions. And I think because they're really used to that, you're going to see the same thing happen in the delivery of products as well. Mm. That's really interesting, isn't it? You've got, I mean, they're effectively turning the whole process into a, a near automated process. But at the end of the day, you've got this sort of human experience, which is making the difference, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I know people that create product every day. So they go out and they'll like make food or they'll make drinks or they'll make soup, right? And they have customers on in all parts of the city. And they'll call Grab Bike and Grab will come and deliver it for them. And it doesn't matter it doesn't matter where it's going. They'll figure out the right routing system and the right time to get it there. And then the entire time that I've seen that happen, right? We talked about these bespoke kitchens, but people are starting to do this in smaller businesses as well. Those because of the expertise that the bikes have in delivering things out, that that works and it's going to work even better as we talked earlier, as all of the POIs and all of the addresses get um, get more sophisticated, as, as that as that information gathering gets more sophisticated. And to be fair, I work with a couple of companies that are focusing on that. In other words, making sure that your addresses are verified. This is one of the big elephants in the room out here, and that is if you look at the mapping, we talked a little bit earlier about this, companies like Google and companies like Facebook will offer services where they, they'll put your company on the map. The only problem is, is that the Google My Business and the Facebook business pages don't do any curation or checking as to whether that address that you provide them or where they guess your business is, is, is verified. They don't verify. Yeah, that's a big problem. I mean, we, you don't sort of appreciate that until you go to a country where that is a problem. I mean, I lived in Spain for a while, and this is a country where roads have two or three different names. So, you know, you have this problem and, you, you know, growing up in the UK, living in the UK, I'm sure it's the same in the US as well. You know, everything's pretty much standardized and you just assume that that's the case, right? I mean, if you go there, you go to what it says on the map, you're going to turn up and the store or the school that you've been looking for is going to be there. But in other countries, it's, you know, it's a, a crapshoot sometimes. Yeah, I mean, the house in which I live here, it has an address, but it's kind of irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> and it reminds me of, and I think you and I have spoken about this before, but it reminds me of the house in which I lived in Tokyo. So I lived in a, I lived in a, a concrete house. It turned out that the house next to me was concrete, okay, and kind of a similar box shape. It also turned out that that person had the same model car that I had. <laughs> now, this would only work in Japan because each of our homes actually had the same address as well. You know the way it works, right? right. You, live on a, you live in a neighborhood, like on a block, and on the side of the block, everybody kind of has the same number. Right, you don't have a number to the house, right, like you would in another, <laughs> no. any normal country. No, so that's so that it made it like logistically difficult there. But again, because the Tarkubian guy only served that, you know, yeah. three streets right? Three main streets in, in that neighborhood. He figured out who everybody was and he made his own notes. And I think because we're at the beginning of that here, that's kind of starting in, in Bangkok as well, where the motorcycle taxis are now moving from being businesses that just distribute people around to businesses that distribute goods and in some cases services as well. Mm -hmm. So it's getting better. And I like the fact that that people are building software around controlling those services, regardless of whether the addresses are good or bad. But that, that whole system is actually starting to get much better as, um, as, as time goes on. Hmm. Do you, I, I know you've, you've already talked about them, but do you hold out much hope for players like Line in that market? They don't have a lot of infrastructure except for the fact that they have a messaging relationship with people. And they need a growth story, right? So this for them is their... <laughs> you know, what they can tell yeah, they investors, do. right? They do. And, you know, the team that runs line is exciting and young and really fancy and everything like that. But I just, I don't see them getting into the logistics business and succeeding against companies that just do it. I would actually think, and again, this can be slightly controversial, but I actually believe that Uber could get into the sticker business before <laughs> and succeed before line gets into the logistics business. Because, 
it's so much harder. The barriers to entry there are so much higher, I think, from a right. from technology standpoint, right? Like if your chat thing goes down, yeah. you literally just jump onto WeChat or you jump onto WhatsApp or you jump onto iMessage or whatever your embedded chat is on your phone. But if your delivery thing goes down, I don't think you – screwed, yeah. And you switch because the guy or gal that's already delivering your product or service already has it. And the level of frustration that you get with that, I think, is just so high. I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just interesting because they're in the market. I mean, I wonder like a player like Snapchat as well. I mean, you know, whether they've looked at this market as well because, again, a bit like Line, similar in their setup. They need a growth story. I know they're not big in Asia at all, really, compared to the West. But for these kind of players, you know, these sort of growth stories, which in a way I'm not particularly bullish about, but I think they have to have something to go back to the investors to convince them that there's a, there's a 10x there, right? And I can see why Line have gone for this because, it, you know, they could easily sell that story of having X million relationships, whether they're relationships or not, I don't know. But, you know, subscribers, users, which could, they could then upsell services to, and each one of those users could be worth X hundred dollars a year or whatever. So that's sort of an easy sell for them to the investors who are kind of eager for that kind of big growth story. But whether or not that actually comes through is a different matter. Yeah, again, it just reminds me of when McDonald's tried to sell pizza in the United States. You know, their idea obviously was we already have customers coming in. They're already ordering food. We know how to automate processes. We already order ingredients. We know all this stuff. But the idea of someone going to McDonald's for a pizza was just anathema. It just wasn't the way people wanted to exist when they were there. They wanted a hamburger. They wanted French fries. They wanted a sandwich, right? Yeah. And a Coke. And and McDonald's at least a while ago just stopped testing the pizza business because at least back in the day it didn't work. And I think that if you're a company like Uber where your entire business is is predicated on the fact that you run a great logistics stack – I think building other things on top of that is probably way easier than a chat application like Snapchat or WeChat or um, or Line actually building a logistics business. Now, you can make the case that in China, a company like WeChat runs a big payments business, but I think that's really different because, again, you're just talking about a peer-to-peer -peer relationship between people where there is – it's frictionless, so there's no – time to delivery it's just software saying please move this digital thing into that digital bucket and i think that's really different from a payment perspective than actually moving physical goods or physical physical people from one place to another mm. right without a doubt all right so switching gears to consumer recommendations now a lot of people go to thailand what would you recommend a food delivery service that they should try out. Obviously, they should be out there in the night markets and eating the food stalls and that sort of stuff. But if they wanted to try a food delivery service, which one would you say they should try? Well, if you're if you're a consumer, frankly, I think you try them all. And if you look at the ones that have the biggest the biggest reach, I think you're going to find that Food Panda really has the biggest reach. It, it might, not, and again, that might be why it's not as reliable as you'd like it to be. I think over time, though, you're going to see Uber Eats though they do have fewer restaurants today. And I think Ginja really is going to make a push to, to be one of the biggest players in this market. I wouldn't recommend people using Line for now. I, I frankly have not had a great experience. And I, I, I just don't think they're going to have people using it for that. And the less people use it, the less good it gets. Now, Chef's XP is one of the oldest ones out there. But to be fair, they don't have a massive number of restaurants on their platform. And I just – I think these things consolidate into one or two and I just don't feel like they're going to be the one or the two that actually get consolidated into. They might get bought but they just don't have enough stuff on their platform to, to make a difference. If it were Michael, I, I would really focus on the Ginja and the Food Panda. Mm -hmm. I'd give Uber Eats a shot because the thing that they're banking on is that everybody already has an account there. Mm -hmm. right? So when I take an Uber, I don't pay cash and I don't pay with bank transfer – I don't have to go to 7-Eleven to, to solve my bill. I just do it like I would do it in the United States and I pay by credit card. But I think that payments is going to move away from actually being a problem in Southeast Asia sooner rather than later. And I don't think it's really going to matter. But right now, the, the two biggest players here are Food Panda, And I think Ginja is going to come up and take a lot of this market away because of their full stack. And that, that's kind of what I would recommend as a focus. 
Excellent. Michael, we usually finish on a, a surprise. Do you have a surprise <laughs> this week? Do you have something that you want to share with us? Yes. So I want to do, I want to do two things. And one is we normally do follow up at the beginning of the show, but we've been talking for the past three or four weeks about new funds coming into the market. And I do think it's really important from a full ecosystem perspective to say that last week, another one of the, I would say one of the smartest investors in the region has switched jobs. It's public information, but I want to point it out. Mm. And the reason why is because it brings another player into the market. This guy, Albert, is not switching from one existing company to another existing company. He's switching from Gree Ventures into Berta Principal Investments, and Berta is making a big push. Berta is a, a, a big German uh, media conglomerate, and they're making a big push to sort of professionalize and, and, and institutionalize their investment process in Southeast Asia. It had been run by a guy named Peter Kennedy. Peter's fabulous. And Peter hired Albert Shai to run this business. But again, it's just another big player coming in. They want to do later stage investment. So I know this doesn't answer your original question, but I did want to talk about this and I forgot to do it at the top of the show. But I think it's, again, really important from an ecosystem perspective because it puts another big, sophisticated player. They want to do later stage investments. So I'd say post Series A and Series B investments when companies really need money to grow and they want to use all of the expertise for their principal investment business that they've had in Europe and in Vietnam. They've invested in some very successful companies there. And I think having a new player focus on that particular part of the investment spectrum is just going to be really good. It gets back to something we were talking about before, so a bit of follow-up. And that's and just again, this week, right? Yeah, again, it was, yeah, it was announced awesome. in the middle of last week to the beginning of this week. So that's new information based on the last time that you and I spoke. Mm. And the one other thing, it's kind of a little bit of follow-up as well, but it was announced last week or maybe yesterday. I can't remember exactly when. Remember we talked about the E27 guys, the, yeah. the guys were Tech reporting that Tech in Asia was shutting down their office in um, in India. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I, I kind of thought it wasn't a big surprise because there's a nice sort of friendly competition between those two companies, both filled with great people, by the way. Um, but again, today a story printed that the, the Tech in Asia team looked like they were going to raise another $6 million. They raised a little bit over four back in 2015. But what made this funny for me, again, besides the fact that they're two competitors, was that the article kind of segued into it looked like Tech in Asia was trying to, again, not according to me, according to what I read, right? I only know what I read. But the big surprise was it looked like they were trying to sell themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I like the way you chuckle. But it looked like they were trying to sell themselves. And in the end, the article says, but because they weren't able to find a buyer, <laughs> they went back to their, some of their existing investors and new investors to raise even more money. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Well, so that was an E27 article, right? It was an E27 article about the Tech in Asia team. And I just think it's, again, you know, that's a big surprise that they would report on it really is what it comes down to. But I just like the whole concept of we couldn't find a buyer, but we right. could find people to give us another $6 million, or at least that's the story that <laughs> <laughs> to be able to go and do that. And I don't, I'm not trying to make anybody in particular laugh, but I just thought was, yeah, that's a big surprise. So let's see how that turns out too. And again, I think tech in Asia will still be around because the competition in that space is not so great. It's really just mm. um, two businesses. You do have companies like venture beat and even TechCrunch that employ people in Southeast Asia to, to do stories. And even the next web used to have a reporter out here, but those stories are not as, um, as frequent as the source, obviously in Tech in Asia, E27. But you say yeah, that, that there's quite a healthy rivalry between them. Is it? I, I guess it, you know they know each other pretty well. E27 and Tech in Asia. Yeah, I mean they're both predicated on the same idea that there was no tech crunch in Southeast Asia, and they both wanted to kind of be that business. And what they're both trying to do, I think, from a certain perspective, is create like a new media company. Mm. But in the same way that Tech Crunch did it, I think you're going to see them try to create their own databases as well. But again, they're, they're lagging a little bit behind the development in the U.S., but good for them for going out and trying to do this. The region needs it. And I, I think that that's going to end up being a really good battle between the two of them. But at some point, I believe that those two companies will merge together. Right, they yeah. will consolidation there as well because there are just too many people running around trying to get stories. And think about it, even in the United States, right? Sure, The Verge is out there, but they were bought by a company. You had... 
you know, Walt Mossberg going out and trying to start his Recode company, but then that was bought by by somebody. I actually think it was bought by Vox, which also owns The Verge. Hmm. You know, Bloomberg has gone out and bought a bunch of these companies, and really, and even TechCrunch is owned by AOL. So I do think there's going to be the same type of consolidation here, and I think it's going to be something that happens sooner rather than later. So you'll we won't see too many of these stories about each other anymore. We'll just see stories coming from one source at least. Right, for right, now. and it's not a bad thing either. The consolidation no. is. It? I mean, you know, we don't see a loss of quality really. I mean, they do sort of get treated. Like with TechCrunch, they get a lot of slack, right? I mean, they're allowed to do their thing. You know, I don't see them losing any kind of editorial direction. No, I think it's fine. I actually think consolidation would be really good for the market as well because you'll take some of the weaker, like the tail, off of each one of those organizations, right? So if, let's just say 80% of the stories are good. The 20% that aren't that good will just disappear because you'll have a combination of two 8080s, and I think it'll be fine. Yeah. So not bothered at all. Fantastic. And quick heads up again about your conference coming up. That's just around yes. the corner, isn't it? That's next. Is it next week? I can't remember. 31st. March, March 31st. Yeah. So if today is the 21st, it'll be next, not this coming Friday, but the following Friday, we'll talk about health tech. I will be moderating a panel um, that has Ring MD on it. It'll have a couple of venture capitalists on it. It'll also have my friend um, Paul McTaggart from Medical Departments on it. But it should be good. We expect three to 400 people to be at the conference. So we always enjoy moderating and we look, we very much look forward to doing that. So. Some healthy, lively debate. That is the Thailand Startup Summit. We'll put the details in the show notes. Perfect. Michael, it's been a pleasure as usual. It is. Look for us on Asia Startups. I mean, asiatechpodcast.com. Hashtag us there on Twitter at Michael Waits for any feedback you have. Over the last few weeks, we've started to get people actually writing me emails on LinkedIn, which is nice. So it's good to have feedback from some of the listeners. Keep doing it. We'd love to have it. Thank you, Grant. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.